Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind. I'm your co-host Russ, here with Mike under the new Japanese prohibition system. Yeah, I was actually at my local watering hole last night because today is the first day of, of prohibition. I really feel like I'm in uh, 1920s America. That's right. You can go out to a restaurant, uh, actually not on the weekend if they serve yeah. alcohol, and uh, they can't serve alcohol or adult beverages at all. Yeah, for three weeks, I think. You know, because of uh, the, the escalating uh, coronavirus um, um, people catching it rate, not not death rate. It's just people getting it. And right. uh, I, I was talking to the to the owner of the place I was at last night, and he was saying um, they're going to stay open as a restaurant, but there won't be any booze. And then he, he's Japanese, so I had to explain what booze was. He thought it was a cool word. Booze, it is a cool <laughs> word. <laughs> I, I just, I just think of it as a normal word, but they, they hadn't heard it. I'm always interested in in that. What the, you know, English speakers here know and what they, what they don't know. It's kind of interesting. I was already reading in the news that uh, even though they can't serve, some places are going to have a bring your own policy. Oh, really? That's pretty sort of, interesting. Yeah, which will defeat the, the prevention measures idea. Uh, yeah, I guess but. some. Something else that does happen is it's sort of like the old uh, American speakeasies of the 1920s where they'll lock the doors and all of those in the know still get served alcohol, you know, but uh, you got to you gotta be friendly with your, your local um, bar owner to you get in to on know. that action. You have <laughs> to know the secret door knock. The secret door knock. I was, right. <laughs> I was talking about that last night. They used to have secret door knocks. That's right. Yeah. Well... All I can say is my house is stocked with adult beverage and adult music. So I'm going to no. ride this one out with good yeah. tunes and a I'm good not supply. quite as stocked with adult beverages, but I have to say my bottle of single barrel Knob Creek that I bought last week to commemorate the amazing 10th episode is now... Oh, man. it's like, it's it's like Now it's half because I just poured myself oh. another rather stiff... Uh, Drink there. This, this, yeah. It alcohol, doesn't last you know, long. Bur bourbon this good shouldn't be drunk this fast. I don't think. I think it should be for special occasions. But we have another special occasion this week. Do you know this? Today is episode 11. We're making it our first palindromic episode. Palindromic. So it's 11. Either way, you arrange the numbers. Oh, that's right. So yeah, we won't so have another one until 22. 22. Wow. Yeah, and Which then we'll have 25. Exactly so... Which will be exactly double. It'll be exactly double, one. too. And then we'll have our 25th episode, which is going to be an important one, too, because it's, you know, the silver anniversary, the silver I guess. Anniversary. <laughs> I don't know how they, well, it's not an anniversary. Anno is a year, right? But I don't know. I'll have to get all of the numeral numerologically significant dates and numbers lined up. So, so is episode 13 going to be like a bad one because it's the un mm. unlucky 13? Well, I don't think there can be a bad one, but... Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see. Maybe we'll get a special like mo mojo or you know bone or something to we'll uh, get get a special good bone. juju for it or something. Okay, yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. I know I'm already planned ahead two weeks about what we're gonna be listening to in the classical front, so I know that episode's gonna be oh, a okay. good one. Uh, I have something kind of a special program for that one. You know, next week I've got three kind of just different things, oh, okay. but next week episode 13 is going to have a theme in the classical music department. Oh, a theme. A theme to show. That'll be good. It'll be a theme, okay, of the, right. of the I've got some I chose on my waiting week. list. I've got an actual waiting yeah. list now, and there's a, a release that's going to be coming up before the next episode, but I don't know if I'll have enough time to give it due listening um, time, so maybe I'll hold that one off and uh, just see. So anyway, lots of things. Yeah. Lots of good things up. coming up. Uh, one more thing. Uh, I remember, speaking of uh, music we've just um, recently heard, uh, I think you and I heard the new uh, Tom Jones album this week, yes. did we? I a heard bit it. Of it. I heard a bit of it. That's right. Oh, I heard the whole thing. Yeah. It's called, yeah. It's, it's, um, not, I don't it's have not unusual. Name. No. It's not unusual. Well, no. it's not called It's, it's not, not unusual. usual. It's um, yeah. something about time, okay? It's got a pretty ab abstract looking uh arty album cover too. Now, I, I wanted to mention this because Tom Jones is 81 years old. 
Mm-hmm. All right. It's called his new album is called Surrounded by Time, and it's a it's all cover songs, uh, including songs by Cat Stevens, Bob Dylan, and a few other ones that were covered by other artists too. And that voice at 81 years old, that great baritone voice, is still intact and sounds really great. It was amazing to hear. Like I, you know, he's uh, still as emotive a singer as he was. Um, yeah, well, you know, when he was young, yeah. he couldn't help but uh, unleash that huge voice and other things. But uh, I like in his old age, he's sort of, um, you know, he's adjusted to his uh, limitations, although he still sounds great, but he's also but, got but some But he can more... still kind of get well, up. He, well, he can yeah, still do I mean, it. He's, 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 he's got, he stays in his range. He's really smart but, as a uh, singer. He's also acquired... But he's still got that deep, powerful sure. sound. It's amazing. But he's you know, acquired it's not like some he's, um... subtlety, which he didn't have uh, yeah. in his younger days with that you know, huge instrument of buying, yeah. Uh, there. So yeah, it's uh, admirable. Yeah. Well, he doesn't sound like Iggy Pop, is what we're trying to say. <laughs> no one quite sounds like Iggy Pop. And yeah, can, Iggy Pop is unique. You can right. interpret that um, however you like. What did I want to say? Like, by the way, uh, listeners, do do a little uh, YouTube uh, viewing here because I was watching. Um, Okay, some old Tom Jones videos. There's a live performance of him. Uh, there, the, people do videos on YouTube of themselves watching something else and reacting to it. These reaction videos. Those are kind videos. of annoying, actually. But. Yeah, but these, this one, I just want to point out. Tom Jones singing uh, I'll Never Fall in Love oh, Again. Oh, yeah, 1967 right? on BBC Four. That's like maybe oh, you've seen that greatest video. For, oh, yeah. It's much okay. better than the recorded version. Well, there are several, several of these... Um, uh, videos of these young girls. They're, they got to be teen, you know, maybe high school age or something like that. Maybe even their twenties, some of them. And uh, watching that video, and like just breaking into tears at this performance. And I'm just wow. kind of saying to myself, you know, we're, you know. <laughs> yeah, I almost broke into tears in, after I, Iggy Pop last week. I'm emotional these people. But, you know, yes. <laughs> But for it's a different, different kind of tears. Yeah, That's the thing. Reason, They're yeah. being moved by that baritone. And I'm wondering right. what power is in that baritone voice. Did all the ladies cry back in the day? Or the women, I should say now. That was right? called the voice all that the launched cried. a thousand underpants or something. Underpants, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember seeing as a child, my parents brought me to Westbury Music Fair in Long Island. And I saw Tom Jones perform a few times on this round stage in the center of the auditorium. Did you leave with your underwear on? Or? I did, but a lot of women didn't. They oh, threw wow. their bras and stuff up there. It was really nuts. It was probably something uh, that a, a child uh, my age shouldn't have seen, to be honest. But uh, he was a handsome guy. I'd say you've become a pretty <laughs> balanced adult even after such a traumatic concert experience. Yeah, having a baritone voice, I think, helps a lot. I, that does uh, help. Yeah. I wish, There's not I too wish many I of them around these baritone. days. Baritone, yeah. yeah. I'm just kind of... Yeah, too much soy soy milk in the diet. Yeah, I talk through my plastics. nose. What do you want from me, huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think it's time to get down to the music list. But before we do, I'd like to remind okay. our listeners that in the episode description, you'll find links to all the music we'll discuss on Spotify yeah. and Apple Music. And at the top of the list is a link to the full episode playlist, all the music in one place on Deezer, where you can follow us at username Adult Music Podcast. And if you can't see the description uh, or list on your app or whatever platform you're on, please check us out on our host Podbeam, where everything is neat and tidy to read. And if you enjoy mm. the podcast, please do follow or subscribe on whatever app or platform you listen to us on. And if you give us a ranking or write a review, it will help us get listed in the browsing category recommendation, which will help us grow our audience. By the way, we've hit 600 downloads this week, which is a very nice number to cross over. And uh, if you'd like to contact us directly with any comments or questions, our email address is adultmusicpodcast all one word at gmail.com yeah and please give us a if you give us a just give us a five star rating okay if you're sitting there thinking oh you know these guys are maybe um worth four stars give us five stars anyway because the algorithm is gonna you know is going to boost us a lot more if you give us five stars. Once we have a million listeners, you can start giving us four stars or three stars yeah. or whatever you want, okay? And Just uh, help tell, us out in the beginning here. Can you even tell Iggy Pop to give us one star? Or something? I think he's going to... He probably won't like us now. No, I like I you, Iggy, though. I like those old Stooges records a lot. 
<laughs> All right. Anyway, well, tonight we're going they're to inspirational. Uh, begin in the Baroque, I believe, and going back well, to Bach. Kind of. Kind, kind of. of. Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. With some caveats. That's true. Well, because it's not quite a Baroque. Well, it is. It's well, it's odd. Well, anyway, let's say what it is first. We've got Baroque this on an, on the modern piano, which wouldn't have been possible. It's but it's not Baroque. It's arranged. It's it's Bach. Ah, yes. Mostly arranged by Ferruccio Busoni. So it's really kind right. of romantic Bach. Okay. Yes. Played by uh, the uh, Swiss pianist Swiss Francesco Piemontesi. He's a Swiss. I guess he lives in the Italian part of Switzerland. Okay, he's Swiss Italian, I guess. And this album is called Bach Nostalgia. I guess that would the G H in Nostalgia would be pronounced like a hard G. That comes or, from or a Bach, movie you could title. say Bach Nostalgia. Yeah, there, there's a Tarkovsky the movie called Tarkovsky Nostalgia. Tarkovsky movie from 1983. It's oh, an Italian time. word, Nostalgia. It's the Italian way to say nostalgia. So um, I'm guessing that's in there. All right. Anyway, this album is um, arranged mostly arrangements of Bach by Ferruccio Busoni played on the modern piano. Now, it's it's not all Busoni, but it mostly is. And there's and it's all all of the music is by Bach. And there is but there is one um, Busoni piece, his Toccata, which is um, written in a Baroque style. Although it doesn't really sound Baroque mm, at all. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but but the style, the the way he wrote it was with Baroque kind of uh, ideas in mind. Okay, I couldn't hear that to be honest. But anyway, let's go through this because I, I, I really loved this recording. Okay, this starts out with um, the Prelude in E flat major, um, which has a fugue attached to it. Um, also, which is played at the end. So these the Prelude and the fugue bookend the rest of the uh, program. Those two. Uh, go together they're both um bwv 552 and they're part of the same piece and this uh starts us out right away with what we can get we did this big uh piano sound this french overture you know beginning da -dum, da -dum, called the french overture because louis the 14th would walk into his um chamber or his court with to that rhythm it was very it's very pompous <laughs> sounding all right all right so the french overture it has it's so it's got this big piano tone, and then there are these contrapuntal breaks where the um, the, the music just sort of suddenly quietens, and it's just amazing. This is something you wouldn't hear like in a Baroque instrument. Um, now it's it is um, transcribed by Busoni, so it's using modern piano uh, dynamics, and uh, uh, Piemontesi really makes the most of these. He uh, he really he makes them very strikingly different. In fact. Um, he sometimes some of the the dynamic changes, sudden dynamic changes are absolutely magical. They I kind of had this um, response where I was gonna, <gasps> it just kind of took my breath away for a moment. I was like, wow, you know, it was like really just that surprising. This is really well worth hearing. Um, after that, we have um, two um, chorales like um, that that have been set to. Um, you know, have been transcribed as piano pieces by Busoni. The centerpiece of this disc is Bach's Italian Concerto. Now, this is um, a keyboard work, and this is not um, transcribed by Busoni. It's um, the actual, the one as Bach is. wrote. And th this as one, is. Well, this one was really quite. amazing to me because, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so... It was really different. There's been a lot of, <laughs> you know, uh, sort of interest in, you know, period instrument pieces in recent years and so this sort of goes you know against that playing all of these it works does, on, yeah. on modern piano but and it all sounds you know fine and like a modern piano until you get to this piece yeah um, because what uh he achieves here he actually can get this harpsichord type sound with yeah. a great yeah. facility on the ornaments on the first movement of this piece and so yeah. when i heard that you know the almost plucking quality of that i was like "Ooh, this is you know this is really interesting here um the, like, that first movement it almost sounds like a harpsichord on a piano uh, yeah i want to mention touch piemontesi is a very noty um kind of pianist like he uses a lot of staccato in his playing even in like other works um because i heard um earlier recordings of him playing mozart piano concertos which is really how he made his name in uh recordings and uh he uses like a lot of staccato in those two in rather yeah. surprising ways yeah. and i guess it's kind of a, a baroque technique but he's still using uh Another pianist like this is Vikingur Olafsson. He does the same right. thing. He's very noty. Okay, you get yeah. a lot of notes. 
but he he's uh, he has this amazing ability to 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 phrase to 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 give you a, a really clear picture of the phrase while like kind of like playing each note sort of staccato yeah, he he's gets not a really connecting them. quality to yeah. it and it's um detached each note but still in the phrase so it's so it's very clear but or you know ornate at the same time so yeah one thing that really surprised me i was really curious to hear the second movement which is very lyrical and yes, slow it's very delicately okay, the played the melody here which is very nice uh, in contrast but, to the first one yeah and incredibly the bass on the piano because it starts out that dun dun and the chords uh is just this almost like spider web sort of quality or quiet it's almost almost inaudible but it's clearly there uh, it, it's present, so it's present, but it's like, uh, on the thresh, I wrote on the threshold of audibility. It, it was a pretty amazing effect uh, th that he got here and, uh, playing that gorgeous melody on top of it. Um, in the, <laughs> do you have any, anything about the second movement to say? No, I just noted the, the, you know, the lovely melody. Um, yeah. and it's, it's, he's plays it very delicately, uh, yeah. with reverence, almost mm. like holding something gentle. So he's caressing. Um, a, yeah. I always think of it as caressing a face, sort of, you know, thing. Oh, then stop, the third, yeah, getting movement, me all, yeah. all romantic here. Oh, getting all romantic. It's, it's a romantic, mostly recital. Who getting all hot and bothered? Anyway, <laughs> gotta gotta cool off there. All right. Anyway, the the um the third movement is this big, happy, joyful Italian thing, and um he gets some pretty amazing effects in this. And one part, like when he's playing the bass, he he somehow just by the way he just suddenly. I wish we could play this. Actually, this would be a great one to actually have music samples of, so that people know what we're talking about. But he makes the bass blare out at one point; like it suddenly gets loud, and it kind of has this kind of sound like a tuba. I was like amazed that that, that the sound came out of a piano. There's like a kind of cushiony sort of sound to it. I think he must have done it with the pedal somehow. Uh, mm. I was pretty amazed at the whole sound world he was able to conjure from this Baroque piece, which we usually just get as like a notey piece on the harpsichord or the piano. Modern. Mm. When people play this on the modern piano, they usually play it um, with kind of – they're simulating a harpsichord technique. They don't really so – um, Kind of yeah. sort of suppressed dynamics. Yeah. Right. They, you know, they try to maintain that sound where it would, would have been available at the time, although they're, of course, playing much louder. But they try to go for the same sort of note values, the really quick uh, – uh, deterioration of the notes since you know they don't hold them but um Piemontesi is kind of he, he's um taking the uh, Busoni arrangements as his cue I think in this this is a really inventive performance of this uh, of the Italian concerto I just loved it um I will be listening to this quite often all right so once that's over we get um some other arrangements we have um an arrangement of the um Siciliana movement the of the flute sonata in E flat major BWV 1031, uh, transcribed by Wilhelm Kempf, who transcribed a lot of Bach's um, organ works for keyboard. Uh, he, he put this beautiful movement in the hands of uh, a single player, which is nice. You don't need a flutist around, a flautist, shall we say. Okay, another um, chorale um, movement uh, follows. Comes du nun Jesu vom Himmel herunter. BWV 650. This one's transcribed by Maximilian Schnauss. Also really nice. Then we get the Busoni um, solo toccata. Oh, yeah. Which sort of, which is said to be, have, have been to, um, composed with uh, Baroque um, concepts in mind, but really doesn't mm. sound anything like that. It kind of sounds like uh, the Baroque world falling apart, really. This is, um, yeah. I, I enjoyed this one uh, after, you know, after the uh, Italian concerto, the flute piece and the other ones, they were nice, but I didn't yeah. have anything to note down. But the Busoni, it, this is really dynamic. And yeah. uh, what I really like is uh, in the uh, first section, The is, I wrote menacing bass lines. <laughs> they, they're sort of <laughs> I know, guess, yeah. making me look over my shoulder. And right. then there's uh, the middle section is rather gentle, but then it alternates with sort of very hard percussive attacks. Um, and then, you know, uh, the ending I also thought was, is really this really hammer, hammering dissonant final chord. So it's very non-Baroque, uh, that last uh, note. But yeah, it just feels really cool. 
uh, I guess you could say it's Baroque inspired with, you know, different techniques to implement the same functions or something like that. Uh, yeah, one of the interesting things that the uh, the booklet with this um, album says is that um, Busoni was, um, and a lot of his contemporaries were um, transposing a lot of this old music for piano because it was um, the period you know, before World War One, and you know World War Two would come later, um, and they were kind of looking back to a better what they felt was a better time because I think they felt the world around them deteriorating, mm -hmm. uh, m much like perhaps we do today. Yes, and. Uh, they, you know, they. I think they were looking back to something a little more, you know, perfect or what inspired them in the first place. Usually, yeah. it's something from long ago that inspires but, us. Like people like me and Russ. I mean, I think we, uh, you know, we like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles because they were kind of, you know, we just sort of heard them when we were younger. And yeah, it seemed <laughs> you know, like from a happier kinda, time, even yeah. happier than when we were young. But you know, my last mm. like notation here was this is a fun piece. So, yeah. uh, you know, even though it has sort of this menacing thing and stuff, it's all in good, in good humor and it comes off as, you know, a fun, yeah. playful exercise of music. Yeah. So. Sometimes like, you know, well, well, anyway, let's, let's finish this up. The last is the, um, fugue in E flat major. This is the continuation of the, uh, prelude that began the work. So they kind of act as bookends. It's, it's the bread on the sandwich. The sandwich of Bach, yeah. Yeah, it's this. It's the bread for the holding the meat inside. Well, they, the although Busoni they're pretty meaty themselves, pastrami, Busoni yeah. Bach. But the the thing to listen to on this recording is the performance. This is the performer above. Well, the music's pretty great as it is, but these these performances are not only unique; they're really pretty spectacular. But not spectacular in any kind of showy way. They 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 serve the music, and yet they're really surprising. Like I said. Um, there were there were moments that just took my breath away, and that usually doesn't happen to me when I listen to music. I will be listening to this uh, again and again. This may be one of my albums of the year at the end of the year. We'll have to see. Mm. It's early, but you know we have to see what comes out. I liked it a lot. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Speaking of, um, oh, I know. I don't remember what I was going to say about the <laughs> about the past. Oh, I'm kind of wondering about, uh, you know. I'll listen to like some of the records we used to listen to, like the Beatles, or even in the '80s, like you know when New Wave in the early '80s was happening, and how energetic that music was, especially compared to what you're hearing today. There's like no energy to it at all. It kind of mm. shows that people are we're kind of slowing down somehow in our enthusiasm. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, let's be enthusiastic. So, By the way, that one well, is on the uh, Pentatone label. Uh, it is. Yeah. Or is it? Yes, it is. Me, oh, Pentatone. I'm yep. oh, sorry. I just banged my uh, microphone there. Okay. It is on the Pentatone label. Great sounding recording. Yeah, well, uh, this that's, pianist what, that's is the other thing I, I wanted to say about it. Um, the, there's a lot of room sound in this recording. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not good or bad. It's just a choice. And it, so it's mm -hmm. not a close to mic re, uh, recording. It's not particularly far, but there is a strong presence of the the room that the piano mm. is in and it, it, you can actually if you're listening to it you'll feel that you're in the room uh with the piano but maybe that was a conscious choice uh with that but you know it is one of the sort of unique characteristics i found in this recording that yeah that does capture the sort of short echo of a of a room it's not a hall so so to speak but you know, it doesn't sound like a studio type of sound. Uh, on yeah, this. I I see that as a good thing though, because it, his um his articulation, like every detail, is picked up. So it's not as though we need. Oh, it's not a cloudy in recording. Anyway, no. Yeah, no. I think of the uh, the the very first um, album we ever reviewed on episode one, the Stephen Huff. Uh, the, the 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 Vita Breve one, where, which was oh. recorded really far away from yeah, the yeah. piano, it's kind of it's kind a of hard to distance make out some almost, of the detail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but he had some like colossally loud, um, you know, fortissimos in that in that performance. So I'm, I'm guessing yeah, it could that's have been why because of the, did the that. levels on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Francesco Piemontesi. This is a, a pianist I'm certainly going to follow more closely from now on. I really liked this a lot. I thought he was very inventive. He's a he's got an interesting style. Um, I you know, and I'll you know, you know I'll let you know when something else comes out. Anyway, we have this for now. Okay. Right. 
on we go. Whoa, to, on to Italian music. Now, now, yeah, well, yeah, well, not not all not all Italian music. It's really more of like an Italian's violin. Yeah. And okay. A this is um. And, yeah. And, well. Okay. Yeah. She is a well. <laughs> it's, it gets complicated. This album is called Il Canone. Francesca Dego plays Paganini's violin. Now the violin is called Il Canone. It's a it's a Guarneri violin that uh, Paganini owned, and he uh, gave it to the city of Genoa. And it, I guess it sits in their city hall or some in some government building. And every once in a while, um, some some violinist gets to some lucky violinist gets to play this um, this um, prize instrument and uh, gets to be followed around by secret service agents the way you know who guard the violin you know as make though sure you don't like forget the, it in the a taxi cab or you know leave it out in the sun or something okay now Dego Francesca Dego is um, she was born in Italy um, in uh, Lecco in Lombard Lombardia near uh, the border with Switzerland uh, and her her dad I guess was the is Italian and her mother I'm guessing is I guess it's her mother that's American, so she's kind of she's Italian American, but not the way I'm Italian American. <laughs> I'm American, same, yeah. but I have Italian, you know, roots, let's say, or ancestry. But she's kind of has, actually has an Italian parent and an American parent. So I don't know. I think, she's I think, quite a bit better looking than you are, too. Yeah, well, they all are. <laughs> 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 that's why I love them. Anyway. Wait a minute. This album has two Francescas on it. Oh, does it? Yeah. Oh, oh Francesca Leonardi on the piano. Yeah, that's the that's right. the album of the Francescas, I guess. Okay. All right. So anyway, let's um talk about what's on this first of all. It's not an all Paganini program, which no. I guess is kind of I a relief. It, okay. Well, you wish yeah, it was at some point. Well, I'll, I'll talk were, about that as we go say. through these pieces. Yeah. Well, I, I I think I know what you're gonna say. All right. Anyway, for the first. <laughs> <laughs> um. Although I didn't, I didn't find any pieces on this to be real duds, but I just kind of thought eh, it could have been nicer to hear um, something else. Okay, anyway, the first piece we start with the Paganini uh, arrangement for violin and piano of La Clochette, which is the famous um, melody um, La Campanella that um, is um, used at the uh, in the third movement of Paganini's first violin concerto, and also it's the same melody that Liszt set as La Campanella on the, for the piano with equally um, amazing uh, piano effects as are achieved on the violin here. It's a, it's kind of like a traditional Italian melody. It's really catchy. Um, and, uh, yeah, she goes, you know, there's some high wire acrobatics in this work. She's it sounds really, great. She's got great agility. Um, she's got great agility. Like, she's got a fantastic tone well, too. Yeah. I mean, she's a very refined player. I don't know if, what I got how much her. of it is because I haven't heard her playing on different instruments or if it's yeah. her touch or in this instrument. But what I liked about the sound of this instrument, it it has this kind of burr or mm. edge in the sound that it's like almost like um, putting a fuzz tone on a electric guitar or something. It's it's just a slight. Um, edge to it that it gives yeah. it a lot of definition whether she's playing very soft or sweet or here when she's dancing over these uh mm. you know, these phrasings uh it always makes that tone very present and unique uh, mm -hmm. and so i noted that throughout the the performance that the the timbre of this instrument and and i don't know how much of that is you know in the instrument or in her touch uh, or technique but it's very distinctive and interesting that little yeah. edge on the on the sound it's not a it's not the sort of you know pure sine wave tone of a standard violin there's something extra in here that uh, gives it some extra color that i really enjoyed yeah and i also want to mention this was um, arranged by uh, fritz kreisler the great uh, early 20th century violinist you know so right. um, and he has a he, piece he did, on here also. Yeah, and then yeah. he, he it, the uh, program follows with uh, Fritz Kreisler's uh, recitativo and scherzo capris capriccio, I would guess. But yeah, this was nice too. The the first movement it's a solo of, work. There's no piano on this one. First yeah, of all, the first yeah. movement is kind of somber, and then the second mm. one is kind of dance like. Uh, nice yeah. contrast. Uh, 
but both enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. This, so the, I get, it sounds like a, a bit of an encore piece. That's something mm-hmm. he would have played as a, an encore, one of his own things. Then we get to Now people will probably know this from the, the, uh, the, there was a, I guess it was a movie, the red violin, oh. or was it an opera? I don't remember, uh. <sighs> but I remember when this came out and John Carugliano, the, um, American composer, um, did the, I think it was, I think there was a movie, the red violin and he did the music for it. Mm. And uh, the movie, tra- it sort of followed the, um, the the life journey of this violin from the time it was made and all the hands it passes through through its history to the end. And it's it kind of lives quite the uh, the adventurous life, um, <laughs> you right. know, being stolen and you know played by virtuosi and lost and all these kind of things. Anyway, the Carigliano, uh work it's sort of derivative of the past, but it's uh, pretty exciting work. I, I I liked it. It goes through a lot of different moods, including, um, uh, you know, the, the more kind of um, Paganini esque, um, uh, high wire act um, of you know dancing on the strings, as you said. You know, this this kind of uh, pretty amazing uh, bravura um, mm. playing. Um, yeah, it's a pretty long piece, eight minutes ten seconds. Uh, it clocks in. But it goes through a lot of different styles, and uh, I found that interesting, probably because I'm also thinking of the movie and what happens in the movie. Hmm. So, I don't know. What did you think of this? The uh, I, don't, I don't have any specific notes on this one, so... Yeah. Yeah. I, it caught my ear, especially hmm. in the more the more uh, virtuosic passages. I was pretty... Yeah. Uh, I think I was surprised at how virtuosically he was writing, and not in a modern way. It was really kind of in an old-fashioned sort of way. Right. Um, and I really kind of appreciated that. Next, we have a contemporary, well, the Carigliano is also a contemporary work, but um, a younger composer, and this guy's Italian, Carlo Boccadoro. Um, he's got a work here, Come d'autunno, like autumn, it means. And this was written um, only two years ago in 2019. Uh, nice to have a new piece for this old violin, you know, composed by another Italian composer. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember it. To be honest, it's, it's just kind of, okay. You know, it was okay. Not bad, you know, it was, but, yeah. you know, I can't really, yeah, I can't really comment on it much. I, I didn't, you know, didn't put me off or anything. But I was kind of, I guess I'll have to hear it a little bit more. We get another uh, Paganini work next, the Cantabile, Opus Seventeen. This was mm-hmm. um, arranged by Carlo Boccadoro, the composer who wrote Come D'Autunno, the previous work. Um, also, you know, nice. I liked yeah. it. Next, Unmo a Paganini, Gioacchino Rossini. Okay, this would yeah. have been played at one of Rossini's salons in his um, later life. He got big and fat and would just sort of um, hang, have salons in his apartment. All these great musicians <laughs> would come and they'd play music all night. And uh, yeah, again, this was a kind of this is kind of like a little bonbon. It was a, it was. I liked it nice. for the. It's full of different contrasts of lots of things changing up, and so yeah, I could see it as a live performance being very. You know, entertaining. Okay, this one's uh, yeah, that piece is called Un Mo a Paganini, so it's kind of he's kind of imitating Paganini's uh, something about Paganini. It's not yeah. necessarily his style, but um, something in his personality. Yeah, I, I probably. like this one a lot. Okay, next comes Alfred Schnitke. Okay, a very surprising choice uh, for uh, this program. Um, yeah. But the piece is called A Paganini, so it's um, it's I in dedication to Paganini. It doesn't really sound like Paganini. Yeah. <laughs> this one does I, it. This one I. I the first time I listened to it I didn't like it so I thought yeah. I'll try it again in a different mood and I still didn't like it I just found it <laughs> disturbing so yeah I don't this is the only one on the whole program that I don't didn't care for I liked it um and most of the reason is because I I'm kind of familiar with Schnitke's style and music so I kind of knew what was going to happen before I heard it although I hadn't heard this work before um because remember we did the violin and piano yeah, disc from the Grammy list Schnitke yeah. earlier no no it wasn't from the Grammy list we did it wasn't um, there one on a Grammy program that we did on this one? Not a, not a stick. It was violin and piano. It was um, oh, okay. two sonatas and all these other works. Right. And we we liked that. But yeah, it's a little rougher. It kind of really uh, pushes the uh, the sound of the violin, which kind of is worrying on this uh, precious instrument. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, Extreme but there music. it is. They did it. It's a little. It's it's kind of the most um, ear stretching uh, piece on. But it's not that. It's not that challenging, really. No. It's pretty long too. It's like it comes in at ten minutes, as far as um, these, this goes. So um, just prepare yourself for this one. I'd say, I, I liked it. Anyway, last is uh, the Polish composer Karol Zimanowski, who was um, 
active from 1882 to 19, well, active, those are the span of his life, 1882 to 1937. Um, so the modernist period, I guess. And uh, three caprices of Paganini. Now, these are actually his arrangements. And they're not just arrangements uh, of of Paganini melodies. They're actually compositions made by him of comp of Paganini melodies. The third of them is the famous um, 24th uh, Capris from the, the famous 24 Capris that Paganini wrote for the violin that all professional violinists have to play. And it's a, it's a, it's a theme and a set of variations, and he sets a set of uh, a few of the variations to his own sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, program. Let's say he eliminates a few of them. So, yeah, they're just his his kind of concoctions from uh, three of the caprices of Paganini. All in all, I like this program a lot. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I like this last mm -hmm. thing. I, I said great technique and phrasing. It uh, Yeah. Yeah, just good performance on the end. Well, the thing about this album is the, the star of the show is the violin, not necessarily the violinist. Okay. <laughs> that was what I was listening to. I mean, she's certainly making that sound, oh, yeah, yeah. but I, but I found myself kind of, I wasn't thinking, Oh, you know, Francesca Dego has this great sound. I was thinking more like, Oh, this violin is really interesting. You know, this is the way Paganini, although we don't know what he would have sounded like on it, but I kind of want to, I, I have another recording of Francesca Dego playing on it, and um, I should have compared them really. Um, but um, I, I, I kind of you, you kind of zero in on the violin and say, "Oh wow, this is the instrument Paganini himself actually played, or one of many." He had several violins, I'm sure. I get the feeling that um, you know this this instrument would not be good for ensemble type of playing. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> well, it would never be played in an ensemble no, now. No. I mean, because it's no. just kind of, you but know. Even it's, it's, at any time, uh, it just really stands out um, with that yeah. sort yeah, of laser-like quality to the, the tone of it. Um, that, that said, Dago's a really fantastic violinist. She oh, plays yeah. with a lot of refinement and uh, you know, nice tone. No, and no, I want to hear... Not just technique, but um, yeah. yeah, the Musicality and musicality is, is very yeah. fine. So, Comparing it now again, nice you don't too. you don't know if it's the violin or if it's if it's her really. But if you like compare her to like the sound of like someone like like if I think of someone like Hilary Hahn or Isabel Faust, these are two violinists who have this gigantic big fat sound, mm. and she doesn't have that. Hers is kind of it's it's not it's approaching intimacy, but it's not you know absolutely intimate like mm. as like someone else. Well, well, I'll mention this other violinist later. Um, but it's kind of it's 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 kind of a, a smaller sound, but a, you know, more intimate, but still very full. Yeah. And um, I I kind of I'm interested in this violinist now. Now that I have two recordings of hers, I want to hear. She got to do this project because she recorded the um, the first um, Paganini violin concerto, and it caught certain people's ears, and they kind of it just turned out that she got to make this album with the paganini violin but i'm i think i'm going to be uh keeping an ear out or an eye out for new releases by her actually by the way another violinist i wanted to, wanted to mention speaking of which because um she's coming out with a recording of the 24 paganini caprices is uh the russian violinist alina ibrahimova we very well may be listening to that on this uh, show i haven't really decided yet it hasn't been released but she's got a kind of a really small, intimate sound that I like a lot. Okay, I'm wondering how that's going to sound in bravura works like the Paganini violin, violin caprices. Um, Ibrahimova, yeah, you know, she's certainly got the technique. I mean, she's played other great virtuoso works, but I'm I'm really curious at how that her sound and her technique are going to combine on that. And I'm really interested to hear it. That's coming up though, in the future. That yeah. that, that record gets released on April 30th. All right, enough of small and intimate. Oh, Let's go yeah. on the other end of the spectrum. Let's go gigantic. Gigantic. Okay. But okay. not too gigantic in uh, in comparison, in? anyway, to other interpretations. Yeah, okay. Well, that's an interesting comment, because I was thinking about this sort of thing, too. Um, okay, we're talking about um, Anton Bruckner's symphonies two and the majestic eighth you know a work that people uh really worship okay you got to be you know like you can't really talk negatively about certain sopranos you can't talk negatively about the eighth symphony it's just kind of um mm. people people really 
you know, it, this is a work that apparently saves lives. Okay. People say, Oh, I heard the eighth and my life was fixed or something like that. Okay. People have very extreme reactions to it. It's a gigantic, colossal work. It's monumental, very long. And, uh, as Bruckner described it, it's, um, a mystery. We really don't know, uh, what moves it. And even in analysis, um, when, when scholars do an analysis of this work, it doesn't really fit any of the, uh, set, um, you know, um, you know, sonata form ideas or anything like that. And yet the emotional payoff is tremendous. No one really knows how Bruckner did it. We'll discuss that a little bit. Anyway, this is a recording by the Gewandhaus Orchestra conducted by Andrus Nelsons. Now I wanted to hear this because Nelsons had uh, recorded a series of um, um, Shostakovich symphonies with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And I think that's, I think that set is still continuing. And he's been doing the Bruckner symphonies too. And I haven't heard any of the other ones, but this was a new recording of the eighth. Yeah, and I hadn't some... heard a recording of the eighth since um, the late uh, Gunther Vaughn that I recorded it with the, on RCA with, I believe, the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. And that was a pretty yeah. uh, great performance. I have that that album too, yeah. yeah this this that, new one is on uh, Deutsche Grammophon too. Yeah, as is supposedly the best recording ever made of this work, which, well... Uh, but that the best, most the most recent best recording by uh, Herbert von Karajan mm. and the Vienna Philharmonic. That's the one people kind of point to as the great one. It's got the great sonics. Now some of the really earlier works, um, like by people like Klemperer, I guess, and Furtwängler, um, are, are held up as you know paragons of this work. But they're not in as good sound. You know, they, they, it's using older, you know, sound quality. Anyway, this is a 21st century. Um, Really, so I was kind of thrilled to hear that, and because uh, Nelson's had put had uh, gotten such great drama and detail out of the Shostakovich symphonies, I really wanted to hear this. All right, now the way this is okay, this starts out with um, Richard Wagner's uh, Prelude to the Meistersinger von Nuremberg, okay, and it was very promising. This um, this um, uh, performance as uh, the full orchestral sound. You heard the brass. Uh, everything was really impacting out of the speakers, and I was like, "Oh, this is going to be so good!" Okay, all right, and uh, so anyway, good performance of that. Then we get to uh, Bruckner's Symphony Number no. Two, which I'm kind of unfamiliar with. There are a lot of different versions of this, and um, this particular one is the 1877 Karagan version, which was um, published in 2007. So I think it's the most recent research into this piece. Uh, this is one of the big problems with Bruckner's uh, symphonies is that um, scholars can't really agree on which edition is the yeah. definitive one. There are a lot of different ideas of how they should be, mostly because of the way Bruckner was. He was very indecisive, and um, he had people around him who said he should be more like Wagner, and he kind of tended to listen to them and kind of <laughs> maybe robbed us of a bit of uh, great music. You know, mm -hmm. We don't really know. But we do have some great music by him. So the second symphony, um, full of um, pauses, famously. One of the things Bruckner does, he has a lot of idiosyncrasies as a composer. Um, when he finishes an idea, and he's going to go on to a new one, the music will pause. There'll be like a space. And it's almost like he's catching his breath to say the next thing. Mm. So there's, so there's something kind of human about it you're sort of uh you know this this there's that kind of quality like i really have to think about this before i say the next thing that comes out into the orchestra um anyway this is also a nice performance i don't know this work all that well so i can't really comment on the um interpretation sounded great to me i i can't really say much more but the key point about the key work on this album is the eighth symphony which takes up the majority of cd number two this is a work i really love and i find it deeply moving um especially the third and fourth movements which are just launch one into this um this uh this place of um of mystery that's that's really hard to define it really gets into a realm where you can't really um you know describe it you know it's sort of uh music they say music communicates beyond words and i think of all pieces this one probably does that more than any other it really mm -hmm. kind of communicates the uncommunicable via words to us and we should probably keep that in mind that certain things can't be said with words anyway the first movement starts um actually this, this actually let me just say this is a really good performance okay um the one thing about it though 
is it doesn't achieve the monumentality of like the Vaughn or Carrion performances. And I want to, but I want to say something about that. I don't think any performance will ever do that because I think that time is past somehow. I don't think anybody's going to be able to, we live in faster times and I don't think modern minds and future minds are going to be able to recreate that sort of uh, monumentality. What you do know, you think? I, um, with this, you know, it's hard Brooklyn, to describe. <laughs> yeah, I have a few recordings of this eighth. I think I have only one of the. Yeah, they're second. all old though. Yeah. Uh, the ones I have are all old. And yeah. other than the um, the uh, Gunter van one, um, but so overall, I think that Nelson's is going for a really balanced and flowing version. I mean, Bruckner is is a huge wall of sound that can sometimes yeah. sort of hide like what's going on in the different parts with the, the totality of that. But here, it never gets like too bombastic. And so what I noticed in this is you can always hear the detail in the parts. And it seems to be sort of coming from the center of the orchestra rather than him pulling it out. And I liked that about it. Yeah, I really I, appreciated that myself. I, I yeah. didn't get the parts so much in other recordings I've listened to it. That said, it has a very curious darkness to the recording that hmm. it, it, and I don't want to say that it's it's not only a, a frequency thing but it's sort of a overall tonal quality and even in the, like the the trumpets and the uh, the sort of high brass uh, they're hmm. very Germanic sound quality to that and so it's dark so you know I the first time I listened to this I was listening to it on my uh, my upstairs desktop uh, System, yeah, I heard this in is, headphones, actually. which is revealing, yeah. but you know, it doesn't have the full dynamics. So I was like, well, this is not gonna really do it. So I listened, right. I went downstairs, uh, and planted myself on the sofa for the whole three hours that it <laughs> took to get through <laughs> all of this Bruckner. I, I, I whole hope there was booze available. This. And so, you know, I um, I cranked up the Luxman amp and I noticed that the um, the volume unit meters they were getting, you know. I was cranking out some serious decibels. I hope mm. the neighbors were in the mood for Bruckner that <laughs> afternoon. But it, like, no matter how much I, I like exploded the sound on this, it never, it never sort of um, you know pushed that uh, button of um, sort of edge because it's mm. it's a very dark and deep recording. So to me, it was kind of mysterious uh, in that way. Um, but. At, at the same time that it seems dark, the detail is uh, in there, and so so I really liked this. Um, my, I noted the second. I've only heard a few times. I've heard the eighth uh, symphony much more. Uh, I like. Yeah, this the, is the one I know best of all the. Brooklyn I like symphonies. the symphony too, especially the second movement. The uh, Andante was very delicate, and the finale. Yeah, that that's the one that I noticed all the detail. Yeah. that there was tons of detail, and it was really pretty amazing. And I hadn't heard it that way before. The finale has this like bold brass contrasted with the uh, pizzicato strings, and then this huge timpani ending. And I was yeah. like, oh, so I'm really looking forward to the eighth, and then the eighth. Yeah, the first movement, it's got majestic brass, uh, great low brass. This this ensemble has like really, you know, they've really got the fortitude here. And But even the trumpets sound dark, you know, like as I mentioned. Yeah. So it, it's all sort of centered tonality in that brass. I know they want that menacing quality, which you got at yeah. the end with the brass, with that da 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 at the very end. You know, it's it's it was, re it was really powerful. I, it kind of made its impression The second on me movement. There is very passionate the melody wanders and you follow it as it goes through the different instruments right and the third movement to me sort of is just like a bridge over to the finale it's the adagio it develops Ooh. slowly and broadly yeah. it builds and builds and then and then there's a deceptive cadence at the yes. end when yeah. you think that the um that the um yeah, the climax is going to come, you yeah. know, and then it kind of ends slowly with the yeah. climax. Like he, everything has to be resolved in the fourth movement. But the Adagio, I don't think it's, you could say it's a bridge, but it is kind of a thing in itself. Um, yeah. Wandering is a good way to describe this entire symphony because it, it tends to kind of go off into all these different tonalities. And then there are certain um, 
sort of themes that keep coming back in the same key and then it'll wander off again in another direction. Right. Um, the third movement is where the mystery to me really begins. I kind of think of it as, um, see, I, see, I think the third movement is really profound okay. and I think a lot of people do too. Um, it's um, the ending of the third movement. It, it, it kind of ends on a, you know, it doesn't really climax. It kind of, there's a deceptive cadence and then it goes off quietly and there's, it's, this, there's a real, it's it's and it's just like something just beyond reach, but there's a really consoling quality to the way it ends. It's 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 when I hear it, I just kind of just sort mm. of um, you were moved. settle down. You, I think it's a good work to listen to if you have um, serious problems in your life. I think it'll kind of calm you down a bit. You kind of because it's about bigger things, you know. Now uh, knowing that Bruckner was this devout and almost kind of you could say naive Catholic, you know, you know he was really just. Um, took everything about it literally uh it's probably about hit it, it probably has something to do with um his belief in in god but it's it's about something bigger than us let's just say that and uh you, you kind of get this kind of consolation i i do anyway I get this consolation quality at the end of the third movement i like it a lot okay and part of the reason that happens is because this movement moves very slowly Okay. Oh, it develops really it's, slowly, yeah. It's, it's slower than human beings do anything. So it kind of talks about larger things. Like, think about glaciers. You know, they move very slowly. It's like nature. It's like powerful nature. Something we can't really control, okay? It's, so it's about things beyond our normal human experience by contrast. And I just kind of get that quality from it. That's I think that's why it winds up being so consoling. The fourth movement starts out... Now, I want to kind of... I have the booklet here. Um, it's supposed to be horses, kind of dun, 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 dun. Okay, and that there's a corral, but um, Bruckner had in mind Cossack, Russian Cossack soldiers. There was, um, I think it was the leaders of. I, I should just read this and get it right. Um, the first movement evokes like Bruckner's uh, memory of a meeting of German, Austria, Hung Hungarian, and Russian uh, leaders in Vienna, the three emperors at the time, okay, were yeah. met in Vienna. And so the, I guess the Russian leader had a Cossack army on horseback, and they kind of, he kind of had that. Now, the thing about, I want to point out about this recording, this is the one thing that really surprised me about this recording. The opening of the fourth moon is very, very fast. Um, hmm. And uh, I was kind of wondering about that. Um, it, it, it sounds like aggressive rather than menacing. You know, it's kind of, you know, it's, th there's a difference. And so he kind of goes for a different um, uh, quality there. Uh, another thing we should mention about this um, per particular um, recording is that this is uh, the uh, Leopold Novak version of the symphony, which is the only one that it gets recorded these days back in the Karyon and Vond days they recorded the Robert Haas version and the the difference between these is that Robert Haas sort of understood that the climaxes had to happen at certain points in the score and that there were bars missing because um Bruckner had re kind of rewritten their work because um, there were people giving him advice and he was like following this advice when he probably should have been listening to his own muse and uh, Haas restored some of these uh, bits from other parts of the piece that Bruckner had written to, to get all the the whole all the uh, the proportions right Novak just took these out okay he said you know this is not in Bruckner's hand this is uh, Haas is interfering and uh, so we don't get the climaxes are supposedly a off. This is what uh, Robert Simpson, the composer Robert Simpson, says. So I'm kind of wondering if um, uh, Nelson's doesn't um, kind of do that really fast opening mm. in order to get the proportions, you know, to climax at the right times and stuff. Um, I will idea. say there's great detail in this, and um, another one of the the most moving parts of the symphony is the the coda of the fourth movement, which starts very very quietly and builds to that big C major. Uh, climax at the end, you know, that bum, 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 you know. It's sort of, yeah, I like how it ends. Mm. It, it's like a stately march, and you think they're going to march like off the cliff, but then they slow down, yeah. In, yeah. you know, and then it sort of freezes the time, and then yeah. then the ending comes. So That's it doesn't, an interesting doesn't, image. Yeah, yeah, just go off the cliff. It holds back, 
and make sure you're with them and then you, yeah. know, you get that final and that also final the, the change there. from c minor to c major is what uh, beethoven does in the fifth symphony um he's so like he's thinking about that it, there's something about there's something really positive about it and you yeah. know, reassuring and the, the the way the whole coda starts with the there's that big pause and then it just starts with that kind of like almost um you know you know kind of slowly turning sort of um arpeggiated like figure that keeps repeating and then you start hearing all the mm -hmm. other elements coming in something yeah it's, it's just really beautiful this work is really special anyway i i'm gonna go out on a limb and say because i haven't heard them all but i'm gonna say this is the uh best recording of this work made in the 21st century and i think the 20th century works are just going to stand on their own forever because mm. they're just really you know unique anyway i'd say if you're a brookner fan give this a listen i think the uh the, the opening of the fourth moon is a little odd to hear <laughs> yeah. at that speed other yeah. than that though i thought this was great the detail was fantastic like russ yeah. said i i would agree with that and there there's some nice little surprises in the uh you know some of the quieter passages that i hadn't heard before or noticed before yeah just make sure you have a whole afternoon <laughs> yes yeah. well, yeah. both it's of not... these or split them up yeah Usually when you get a recording of the eighth, it's by itself. But here, yeah, there's a, a whole other symphony, a, another long symphony. <laughs> yeah. It's very long. Anyway, so, yeah, definitely hear this. It's good to hear Bruckner again. I was kind of eager to hear this simply because I hadn't heard um, a, a Bruckner symphony and really um, the Bruckner eighth since the Gunther Vaughn version came out on RCA. Yeah. Yeah, you know, before he died. Yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a really great performance. All right. The, the, this was exhausting to the, the book. So it always is. So I always had to, I, I remember I, I told you, I heard the first disc like earlier in the week and I, I wasn't going to come home from work and listen to the eighth. You know, I, I had to be like well rested and ready for this because you know, I know yeah. it was going to be like an emotional, um, you know, experience as it always is for me. This is, a, this is, I, I can't call it one of my favorite works, but I just see, say, I just think it's really special. I just, um, so I'm always eager to hear it when it, yeah, I, I, I always enjoy Bruckner's mm. symphonies. I just have to be in the right mood and have the right yeah. amount of time to appreciate the totality of it. It's not a you light listening experience, <laughs> yeah. um, but it's rewarding if you can invest the time into it, like, you know, all it is artistic rewarding. things. So. Absolutely. And it's consoling, too. So if you're yeah. feeling troubled by the coronavirus, this is a good time to be listening to this work. Boost your immunity with Bruckner. Bruckner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's get on to some uh, less less heavy, well, lighter fare, let's say. But uh, you know, it's certainly not less. Well, I don't know. The Bruckner Symphony has a lot of meaning to it. I think it's kind of it's pretty up there. Anyway, let's go back to something a little more. Uh, well, let's stay uh, a little bit big. Let's stay, let's stay big. Let's stay a little bit big. But let's okay. go big band. Big band. And it's that big orchestra. Some yeah. big band for you. And a little in, less serious, too. We're not going after, yeah, like, the, the colossal here. Not colossal, but very interesting. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, with the big band debut of the fiery young pianist uh, Stephen uh, Feifke, I believe is how you pronounce his name. From Boston, Massachusetts. From Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah. Well, now, he has uh, sort of uh, created quite an impressive career in his younger years, uh, recording uh, 30 albums before the age of 30 as a sideman. <laughs> 30 before 30. Yeah, as a sideman with lots of jazz greats and uh, working uh, with a lot of different people. And uh, But here, he makes his big band debut with the album Kinetic, which is on the Outside in Music label. And mm. this is quite a debut. Yeah, um, yeah. He's quite and a player, in fact. He is. He's a monstrous yeah. player, and he shows his arranging chops and taste on this very tasty recording. He composes uh, as well. Okay. Yes, composing <laughs> he's got a too. Lot of, yeah. he's, so this, uh, we've got uh, a large amount of original and material and a few old time standards and a classic mixed in here, and so the album gets started off with the title track, Kinetic. And so this is a really interesting beginning. There's sort of a hesitant building of horn hits that launches into some hard driving swing. And then right away we get hit with uh, one of uh, Five Keys piano solos, which is mm. really sort of McCoy Tyner-ish yeah. modern sort of uh, chord extensions and things. 
And I was hearing that. I was like, ooh, you know, it kind of yeah. caught my attention right away. That's always somewhere. a good sign. Yeah. And uh, throughout the whole album, I won't list, I won't read all of the uh, players, but I actually, when they debuted this, there's uh, uh, one of the uh, recordings they have a video for that's on YouTube. I'll put a link of that in the description if you want to see the studio recording of this. But it, there's a oh, lot I of... It. I haven't seen it. Oh, yeah. It's, it's cool. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, great solos uh, from all the horn players and other players in here. I won't, I won't bother to go through all their names because there's too many uh, here. But uh, in the kinetic track after uh, Fifka's piano solo, there's a nice trumpet solo. And then uh, I started to get impressed by his horn, horn arranging because not only does he do great ensemble things, but he knows how to sort of pit the sections against each other. So in this piece, he's got the saxes against the brass. And so they're offsetting each other with these different lines uh, which is you know, really exciting. And then mm -hmm. he has uh, some drum solos exchanging with the band. And so this uh, title track gets things going. And then we have uh, an interesting track, uh, the second one called Unveiling of a Mirror, which has uh, a softer sort of modal section that transforms into more hard swinging. We've got a sax sectional and then backed by these nice trombone jabs uh, in behind a sax solo, trumpet solo, and then back to the softer section. So it sort mm -hmm. of brings you down from the kinetic. And the third track is a really study in uh, meters and times. It's called uh, the Sphinx. And <laughs> this has you, if you try to count <laughs> what's going on here, you're going to get your mind twisted uh, in mathematics. The beginning is uh, a lot of changing time signatures, which then settles into a 5-4 groove. And you get a tenor solo with that over some really heavy drums and band jabs. And then the tune morphs and changes, and then it's in 6-8 <laughs> after 5-4 <five>, to <laughs> the end. So... Uh, you know, it takes you on a real time travel in terms of meters here, which I thought was really interesting. But he does it very seamlessly with all the accents mm -hmm. and the phrasing. So uh, it's a riddle. <laughs> yeah, it's a really uh, riddle. And then, yeah. and then he takes us on a nice little time travel, going back to uh, 1936 with the uh, old semi con tune until the real thing comes along with uh, guest vocalist Veronica Swift. And uh, I have to say, uh, she sings on two tracks on this album. And I, I had listened to her recent uh, solo release. Yeah, I did uh, too. Which yeah. I thought was good, but you know, she's young. Uh, I thought it's not, it, no, no fault in her technique. I just was not completely uh, moved by the total performance. But I have to say, she sounds awesome here. Uh, this mm. uh, big band format, she has the right quality of voice for the big band setting and the band uplifts her and uh sort of pushes her into the right uh you know emotional uh kind of expressions that match the song and it sounds great uh and then we've got a killer alto sax solo in here that's the whole tune is given the really respectful traditional swing treatment and uh it's right in the pocket uh, in between those modern pieces. So, yeah, this was a, a nice smile to your face uh, kind of recognizable tune. Mm. And it uh, moves on. We've got a next tune is called Word Travels Fast. Uh, we've got some piano solo intro with nice flute and woodwinds and a mu muted trumpet arrangement. It grows into the whole band. We've got some fleeting fingered solos on trumpet and sax then. Uh, a nice little tune. The next one is uh, Wollongong. This is a really yeah. burning burning tune. It's got some driving horn lines. This really uh, nefarious modal chord section uh, for a sax solo uh, that's uh, you know dark and brooding, building tension. And uh, the back horn section backing builds into a fren frenzy that then the tune swaps out into like a funk backbeat ending which i thought was a nice uh you know switch over in the in the moods uh and th that's an original tune too uh and then uh we've got uh, a new arrangement of nika's dream the old horace silver tune 
Mm. And, Always good uh, to hear Horace compositions. Yeah. And what I liked about this is the arrangement is great because a lot of times you'll hear this played uh, either by, uh, you know, a smaller jazz group or a big band, and they play it really fast. But this is not too fast. And what's really interesting about this, it's got a very cool bass and berry. There may be a bass trombone in here. Uh, I wasn't listening to this on my uh, better system, so I, I didn't pick out all the instruments, but there's a syncopated bass counterpoint line to the melody that's original, and it sounds really cool. Um, and then uh, Fifeka puts a nice piano solo with some really funky left-hand rhythms over accented drumming. The drummer mm -hmm. here really is pulling out some interesting rhythms. And then we've got a, an excellent trumpet solo with a flute background. So this was a nice arrangement of, you know, a tune that's probably familiar to a lot of people. And then after this, uh, we bring uh, Veronica Swift back out on the stage to the old uh, Learner in Low Tune from My Fair Lady on the street where you live. Mm. And uh, she sounds great again, very inspired by the band. And this is a really cool arrangement because I... How they choose to back the vocals is with an ostinato kind of backing, a repeating riff that stays static. And so she's outlining the chord changes with the melody, but the backing doesn't change with the chords. Mm -hmm. And so you, you kind of want it to change, but it doesn't. So it builds this tension. And then when the tune gets off from the verse, the you get these uh, awesome trombones and this uh, sax glissandos, and then it goes into the full swing, you know, uh, treatment, and she soars above that band arrangement. It is, it's a really great uh, arrangement of this tune, very inventive, and it goes someplace. I'm wondering if she needed this band on her record, which, by the way, Veronica Swift's record is called uh, This Bitter Earth, if anybody's interested right. in checking it out. Yeah. Like, it's the most recent one. But yeah, I, she sounds a lot more confident. Here. I liked I liked the album, though. I mean, mm. um, you know, but... Yeah. I, yeah, I think she's a lot better here than she was there. It just you know, sounds exactly. more more confident and inspired. Uh, yeah. And then we've got a couple, two more tunes. There's one called Midnight Beat. This is uh, out of the swing pocket. It's more of a R and b rock beat. Uh, it's got a great feel to it, a nice acoustic bass solo, some alto sax. And the last tune on the album is called Closure, uh, fitting mm -hmm. to end it. It's more of a lush ballad. It's sort of, it doesn't go out right. on a bang. It sort of goes out on a nice tone. But as a first big band venture, this is awesome. The arrangements yeah. are, are adventurous. If you take the time to really listen closely, you can appreciate all the detail and variety he's built into these arrangements. Uh, very interesting, fresh and cool sounding, but rooted in tradition. Uh, he's got a lot of talent in both his playing. It, when you see the video, you see there's a bunch of young players here who play really well uh, together. Yeah. And it's a very inspired album uh, for yeah, new big band music. I really recommend it. You know, throws off complex uh, musical structures with confidence, and he's a he's a great piano player too. I really oh, yeah. enjoyed hearing his playing. Yeah, his really yeah, yeah. presence. It was really his playing and the two Veronica Swift tracks that kind of really caught my attention, and the, the various solos as well. Yeah, uh, a lot of variety on this recording too. I think he's really this is like almost like it sounds like a calling card recording. He wants to show what he can do compositionally, yeah. and you know. Very nice balance. Know. I mean, having those yeah. two vocal tracks strategic, strategically. Or statistically placed. Strategically. Uh, strategically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, is, what, you is what I'm looking for in there. And then also with the Nika's Dream, which I've heard various, you know, big band treatments of over the years, but he's got his own unique take on that. Yeah. Yeah. Really nice program. Nice to hear something like this fresh uh, coming up here in the uh, 21st century. Jazz really is happy. happening, people. You just got to know where to look. <laughs> you know, I'm really happy that, you know, in the... I, I shouldn't say recent, but uh, in this century anyway, we've got uh, Christian McBride and uh, the uh, late now, uh, Roy Hargrove. Uh, hmm. But uh, jazz artists who, you know, made their mark and then decided they also wanted to do, you know, something with a big band because they love the format, which is, you know, commercially, financially, it's a difficult format to... Uh, yeah. pull off with all the musicians involved uh, especially under these uh, you know new conditions of uh, streaming music and now coronavirus so yeah. uh, I appreciate the dedication 
uh, to that art of fine arranging and large ensemble. And, I think uh, you have to form a sort of collective in order to get this I to think work, you do. You know, where yeah. everybody's like in this pool and they're doing all these different projects. And yeah, you know, but this one is good, like and so check yeah. it out, uh, Kinetic. Yeah, that's a, a nice, a pleasant surprise. And for me, an even more pleasant surprise is what we're going to talk about now, I believe, oh. is the, uh, let's Conjurer. see, Stephen Slagle, right? No, uh, before that is oh. the uh, Jacob uh, Dinison, oh. um, The Blessings. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we talked uh, in previous episode uh, about uh, Snorri Kirk, the right. uh, awesome uh, Norwegian-born Danish uh, drummer, and we were really impressed with his uh, swing things. I've got my two my two recordings arrived from Germany, so I've been enjoying those, <laughs> and because uh, I couldn't find them in Japan anywhere, but right. I'm happy to add them to my physical collection. I love them so much. With still, that, still still waiting for Get Up to come out on CD. Record ah, yeah. Company. No, I actually bought the <laughs> I bought the download of that, and you I did. sprung for the high res. Even it's only a couple hundred yen more. I want a I said, CD. Come on, put what out the, a CD. Well, guys. I wanted it, but I, I, think I wanted it eventually. now. They eventually yeah, I know be you. out there. You sound, but, you sound like me. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't wait. I had to have it. Anyway, um, so with that in mind, I I was sort of okay. We need more Danish jazz, and then I yeah. looking through the new releases, I saw this. Uh, and I said, well, let me check this out. And then I decided we would include it here. And this is by the uh, Danish saxophonist, Jacob Dinesen. Yeah, I think uh, the, 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 uh, the headlining player here is Anders Christensen, the bassist. He, he seems to well, get top billing. Um, yeah. It, and he from does what play I understand, a lot, uh, it's, it's billed equally between the three and mm. also a lost sonne on drums. And mm. so these guys are all major Danish players, uh, although uh, West, other you know, American audiences may not be familiar uh, with them. They may be better well-known in uh, Scandinavia and Europe. Right. But uh, Dennison and Christensen have played uh, in a famous group called Once Around the Park. And mm -hmm. apparently uh, the drummer, uh, Lost Sonne, played in a uh, well-known Danish uh, rock band, uh, but he also does uh, jazz too. So they're, they're well known musicians uh, in Denmark. And well, a, yeah. a Snorri Kirk type swing band, they are not. They are not, no. <laughs> uh, and so they it's have uh, these uh, jazz influences, but also some rock. Uh, and other music influences. I noticed in that right away. The rock. Yeah. I said this is kind of sounds like a rock. It's even produced like a rock album with the big fat drum bass drum yes. sound and the uh, bass uh, guitar. The the acoustic bass is just right up front. Yeah. And so yeah. these are these are uh, all live recordings, uh, mm. which isn't apparent from the beginning because you don't get any audience uh, reaction sounds and cheering until uh, later on in the tracks. But it is in fact a live recording. And uh, so we've got a few different uh, tunes here. The first one is uh, uh, Free Eddie, which is uh, a Denison original ballad that has a very uh, searching quality. And it starts out uh, mainly with just uh, the sax and bass. The, the uh, drums come in later. Uh, and then uh, the next tune is I've Told Every Little Star, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Jerome Kerm Oscar Hammerstein uh, tune, which uh, was recorded by Sonny Rollins in his trio, uh, pianoist trio, and this so this is a real ode to Sonny Rollins, uh, and he Dennison captures the spirit of Sonny Rollins, but he has a much softer tone to his playing. Mm. It, it's it's so it's different. It, it's a tribute, but you know, in his own style of playing, so that's kind of enjoyable and becomes very familiar. Uh, the next tune is uh, an interesting sort of turn from that fair. Uh, the drummer, uh, Los Sonne, has written this tune. It's called Anuar. And this is a tribute to the Tunisian Oud player, Anuar Brahim. Yeah. And, and so this is... Um, I caught that. It's, it's uh, based on these, uh, you know, Middle Eastern modalities. And it's a very dark and interesting uh piece uh, for improvisation. And then yeah. the, the next piece is, uh, I, I won't be able to pronounce this correctly, so uh, forgive me. Uh, uh, it, I believe it's Tik Vals. And this is uh, a thoughtful yeah. type of composition by Dinesen. This is dedicated to uh, Danish media personality, uh, Morten Lindbergh, 
uh, who seemed to have uh, been a fan friend of a lot of uh, jazz musicians and a friend of uh, Denison hmm. on uh, this composition. So it's uh, it, it's a very contemplative uh, type of piece. And then uh, we've got uh, Sandino, which is uh, a Charlie Hayden, uh, the great bassist composition. And this is uh, builds to a nice climax with a lot of great bass in it. And uh, rounding out the program, we've got uh, Freedom Jazz Dance by Eddie Harris, which was recorded on Miles Davis's Miles Smiles. And uh, <laughs> But this has a really uh, nice intensity over some really kind of heavy rock-influenced drumming. Yeah. And yeah. uh, but the bass is laid down uh, really well overall. Yeah, the the bass on this uh, by Anders Christensen is is really heavy and steady, and yeah. uh, that sort of really marks the presence without having a piano or any uh, uh, guitar or harmonic instrument here. So um, I, I enjoyed this, uh, but you know I'm trying to educate myself onto the character of. Danish jazz, and hmm. I, I would it's assume, like it has a lot of characters. Yeah, I mean, hmm. it, this is a bit brooding and dark, especially in contrast to the Snorri Kirk. But I really liked yeah. the spatial quality and the rock solid uh, bass playing uh, in this ensemble, uh, and the freedom, you know, from having something pianoless here. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, kind of a free, a free spirited, uh, but dark darker uh, improvisational uh journey but worth taking and i enjoyed listening to it yeah the 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 the, the, f the fat bass sound or should we say uh plus sized bass plus sound sized. <laughs> yes. we get, that bass, we get here. bass at any size Isn't that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i did like that because it kind of appealed to my rock and roll uh or my rock let's say you know um uh you know kind of proclivities or you know my my youth and stuff but yes. the thing i noticed about this album mostly it's 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 produced right it's not mm. like it's it's a live performance but there's um the um the bass drum sound and the bass sound and the uh the uh the saxophone too is that a saxophone what is that yeah. uh, tenor sax yeah it's kind of the the sound is kind of manufactured it's sort of it's produced there's there's some kind of like thing that's altering the uh the uh, i'm kind of wondering if it actually sounded like this live it very well may have because it was coming out of speakers um but it, it kind of put me in mind of how like we heard that live recording for the uh, grammys about christian scott atunda ajua where it, his sound is going through all these sort of like um sort of processors and it comes oh, out yeah. sounding like something different i kind of got that feeling from uh the jacob dennison uh T tenor sax sound. I was kind of wondering what his like naked sound sounded like. Um, th this was kind of produced like a rock record. I thought, um, yeah, it was it was dark. Um, be because I heard the previous the, the record we're going to talk about next first, I, oh, <laughs> it kind of, it was kind of a downer for me. But I hear what you're saying. I I did like it. I mean, I didn't. I you know, it was kind of. I, I just felt like it was kind of like inflated sort of by the uh, production sound. And I mm. I didn't think much about that. I thought the performances were great, though. I, so I was happy about the performances. I just would have preferred to hear it. Actually, I was curious about what it sounded like in the club, as with the uh, Christian Scott recording. You know, it's kind mm. of like, yeah. you know, so that's there, what I... Yeah, there may have been yeah. a lot of post-production on it. It's hard to say. I, I would have preferred a cleaner sound on this on this album. They but they they went for this intentionally. It's not a bad recording. It's just no, this no. is the sound yeah. they wanted. You yeah. Know. So I was kind of uh, I was lukewarm about this. It was good. Yeah, it was good. I'm not I, over the I hill on the, it, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, you know, apparently uh, in the Danish jazz, these are well known musicians, and I'd like to learn mm -hmm. more about uh, that scene. I'd like uh, to hear them in other contexts as well. I'm kind of yeah. wondering what they would uh, sound like if they're always kind of, if this is their vision or if they have other kind of mm -hmm. tricks up their sleeve, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, All right. I'll be looking for more from that part of the globe. Well, let me know. Jazz, yeah, I'm kind of so. curious. European jazz is kind of an interesting thing. As is, by the way, Japanese jazz. we got to do some Japanese jazz one day. I'm waiting for one of those Japanese pianists to put out a, a record. We'll get them on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean... Yeah. There's actually a lot more recordings by 
volume coming from Europe than there is anywhere else. So uh, yeah. there's a lot of they things really to sort our, through. Yeah. I remember meeting a lot of, when I was in Italy, a lot of Italians like play jazz now. They don't play classical. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, it was, it was inter it's interesting. There's a big jazz scene there. And uh, when I go to uh, Rome, I stay in this uh, hotel where the, um, the two uh, concierges are big jazz fans. And apparently like a lot of the local, the jet, when there's a festival, the jazz musicians yeah. stay there. I get uh, Villa San Lorenzo near um, St. John's Lateran Church. If you're in Italy, you might want to, you know, tell go there and tell them we sent you. <laughs> yeah, and my right. my favorite uh, trumpet player from uh, Italy, it, uh, Fabrizio Bosso. Yeah, Fabrizio yeah, Bosso. He's great. Yeah, yeah, when our friend in uh, Italy, Nathan, uh, met him, I, when I found out he was coming to Japan, but he was not coming to Kansa. He was only yeah coming to uh, Nagoya or something I was really well you know now we now have a podcast so we can get him to come to uh, uh, know, uh, to the Kansai like area come. Yeah. yeah if anyone can come if we ever have live music again Fabrizio <laughs> please come yeah it'll happen eventually yeah alright anyway that brings us to our final recording which is a product of the uh, COVID situation uh, sort of a breaking through that uh and it's called uh, Nascentia by yeah. the American saxophonist Steve Slagle. And yeah. uh, Slagle was, uh, if you don't know about him, he's uh, a native of Los Angeles, but he grew up in Philadelphia. And uh, he had a scholarship to Berkeley College of Music. And uh, he also has a master's degree from the uh, Manhattan School of Music. And he's worked with so many uh, jazz greats, uh, Ray Barreto, Steve Kuhn, Lyle Hampton, uh, Carla Bley, uh, many, many more, um, Mike Stern and others. But uh, so it, through his work, he's been uh, especially had a lot of Latin influences and he's also appeared on albums by uh, Milton uh, Nascimento. Uh, and so he's got a lot of... Uh, different flavors of influence in his playing. And uh, also in the 90s, he was a figure in the uh, Charles Mingus big band, which is always an interesting ensemble. And so this album uh, was recorded uh, after the Corona epidemic. And uh, so uh, he sort of uh, states that uh, he found that it opened up chances to make music in a more composed way. Uh, and have a positive and driving force to it to offset the darkness of the uh, situation that uh, we're all in. But uh, musicians uh, feel this sort of uniquely because of the lack of opportunities to play live music. And this nascentia, which means birth, is sort of breaking through that. And you can tell that uh, the musicians here were all really excited to record this new music and uh, get it out. Uh, and they, and they being, sound like it too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so this is a really joyous sounding recording. And yeah. uh, I, I really uh, think anyone who likes jazz will enjoy this. Uh, yeah. So uh, it says, uh, it's Slagle's hope that this recording helps to musically herald a new beginning to our world in 2021 with cheers for new sounds to appear and clear the air. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He said, he even said the title na nascentia, the word nascent would mean like something being born. Yeah. So it's so a nascentia. Birth. He described it as the bringing forth of something with future potential or simply birth, which is yeah. kind of what nascent means. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have yeah. uh, Steve Slagle on alto sax and flute, uh, fine, fine playing uh, by Jeremy mm. Pelt on trumpet. He's always good, but he sounds really tuned in here. Yeah, uh, everybody does. Yeah, you know, I noticed Bruce Barth is on this recording too. Yeah. And he was really fantastic got, too. We don't hear enough of him. No, we've got Bruce Barth on piano, and uh, Slagle also said that uh, he was uh, inspired to bring in a third voice for the melody. So we've got uh, Clark Gayton on trombone, uh, who adds a lot to this. And we've got uh, Jason Tiemann on drums and uh, a bassist, uh, Ugana Okeguo, who uh, I've come to know through his recording with the uh, trumpeter Tom Harrell, uh, a fine uh, 
intricate bass player. And so that's hmm. the ensemble here. And uh, so the album begins with a short upbeat intro piece. It's rather short called We Release. Hmm. And it's really just a setup uh, into uh, the uh, Nascentia Suite, which is a, a series of movements, uh, really, uh, that get us uh, into the main features of the music. And the first part of the suite is called All Up In It. And uh, so this starts out with a kind of staccato melody a la Miles Ahead, uh, you know, that da, 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 da kind of hmm. syncopated uh, staccato melody. But then it contrasts with a legato section, uh, some really inspired sax, trumpet, trombone, and piano solos that set the mood. Uh, and then the second part of the suite is a drum interlude uh, by uh, Tiemann, which sort of carries us over into the next full movement, which is called Agama. Uh, and this one begins with uh, all horns melody that hands off to a uh, trumpet and sax melody with the trombone sort of backing them. Then we get a really hot Slagle alto solo and some really great uh, trumpet work by Jeremy Pelt, uh, a nice dirty uh, trombone solo, and then uh, a nice Barth piano solo. So all the solos are really uh, kicking in by this point. And then the next part of the suite is a bass interlude. And uh, here, uh, Okeguo sort of mellows us out with a nice uh, rhythmic kind of uh, ending to the interlude that carries into uh, a new tune that is not part of the suite, but this is the actual the Nascentia. And mm. uh, this is a feature for uh, Jeremy Pelt, and trombone drops out on this one. This builds off the bass riff that is established in the interlude, and it has a sort of bassa type of beat, so we're away from the sort of swing thing. And uh, here we get a really lyrical uh, Jeremy Pelt trumpet solo, uh, a nice searching alto solo, and then uh, Bruce Barth, he has this really great solo that's these huge chord clusters and then these cascading pretty piano lines. Uh, mm -hmm. He does these both really well, the left and right hand. It sounds like you know, two different instruments also. Um, the next tune is uh, Who Compares to You? And this is a medium tempo swinging sax feature for Slagle. Uh, it has a little uh, relaxed Bruce Barth solo with some nice punctuation and a short bass solo, but it's mainly all about the sax. Uh, then we've got uh, another tune called New Note. Uh, this starts out with a really burning sax improv solo uh, into a sax and trumpet melody. It has a lot of pauses, uh, these sort of things that set up expectation. And then Pelt builds a really well-structured solo here. Great phrasing, and you can really hear the influence of Freddie Hubbard here. Uh, he really pays ode to Hubbard's style of building a solo. And then Slagle comes back, another really intense solo. And then uh, Barth adds another great solo after all, both of these other ones uh, with the great sort of left-hand syncopation. And then hmm. we've got trades between the instruments, uh, drums, sax, and trumpet uh, on this tune. Uh, following that up is a uh, tune called I Remember Brit. And this is uh, uh, an original by the pianist uh, Harold Mayburn, dedicated to trombonist Brit Woodman. And this has uh, Slagle switching over to flute, which he plays very nicely. Uh, and it has kind of a Brazilian beat to it. I wouldn't say it's a, strictly a, a bossa nova beat, but it has that uh, even character with uh, kind of Brazilian accents to it. You get a real soaring flute solo that really goes through all the registers. He's going from low to high effortlessly, so the, the tone quality keeps uh, uh, changing as he goes along, and a lot of uh, ornaments. Uh, so his, uh, his uh, technical ability on flute is really good. And then, but here, Pelt sort of uh, chills out 
on the groove and his solo after this dazzling flute is really mellow but right at the end he has these sort of clifford brown-esque figures that he just throws in uh as uh, embellishment that i really liked and then a mellow uh, trombone solo and uh finishing up with some fleeting lines by bruce barth and uh then the last uh tune is called a friend in need and uh, this was written by Slagle for uh, Michael Bricker. And this mm -hmm. features uh, Bruce Barth. It's a medium tempo, uh, kind of sweeping melody sax piece. And a very nice uh, Bruce Barth solo that uh, has these huge uh, block chord building with also nice lines. And then it comes back to the sax uh, melody that's uh, a nice melody. And then you're sort of done. Uh, but Wow, what a uh, energetic album. Everybody sounds really happy to be recording, and then you're just going to be in a really happy mood after you uh, listen to this one. Yeah, I, I wrote down what a ray of sunshine this record was. Um, it's very, um, yeah, the, the, the whole thing is upbeat. It swings, and, I would, to, and to think I wouldn't have listened to this if you hadn't sent it my way, because the first thing I noticed about it was that the, the um it has a sweet a jazz sweet on it and i usually dread the word sweet when it's applied <laughs> to jazz because it usually means it's going to sound like somebody's um you know your conservatory graduation project that they wanted to right, record right. and that's not the case at all here it's just this big joyous noise it's, it's like a big block party it just sounded fantastic it yeah it I, it had me kind of i i listened to this in the headphones on the street and i was kind of like bopping along and people were looking at me like i was nuts and i was but uh i didn't care because it was yeah. so good and i was I guess, really you happy know, the suite mm. here is probably um i i this is just my uh projection onto this and i could be completely wrong but mm -hmm. uh having probably you know a pause in performing and then being able to uh try out musical things with other players and social distancing uh working with ideas and compositions uh probably lots of musicians have had a lot of time to sort of think of how to relate and connect their ideas uh, mm. before you know normally they would have maybe tried them out and established them as different tunes but he's probably had a lot of time to sort of stew these ideas together and then see how they would you know connect into a integrated program to great effect and mm. and, and so rather than like you say being some kind of pretentious yeah. uh, <laughs> project of something no this is a really heartfelt uh expression yeah. of really uh well thought out program of music uh, that features all of the players very balanced and uh, uh happily uh really yeah. expressing a lot of things nobody sounds uh like you know just going through the motions or anything here there's lots of bursting uh emotion and expression coming out of all these players here so it's it's really enjoyable yeah yeah it is yeah, just thinking if it, if if you ever want to, if anyone out there wants to sour my mood, just tell me that you wrote a jazz suite for me. <laughs> but if but if it's one like this, that's then it's okay. But just yeah, that word yeah. jazz suite just puts me off. I don't know. But no, I'm glad I heard this. Yeah. In fact, this is going into my collection. I liked it so much. It was just so oh, positive. Great. It just lifted me up. I think this is the kind of thing that can. Uh, bring the sun out on your rainy days. Yeah, I didn't know um, what to expect. You know, I, I had, I mm. knew the name Steve Slagle and I've heard a few of his uh, solos on other people's albums and then the name sort of threw me, you know, what is this? And then, but when I saw that um, it had, uh, you know, this lineup of players, I thought, oh, well, this, this has got to be good with uh, Jeremy Pelt. And, I like uh, Jeremy Pelt a lot. He did a yeah. great record, The Art of Intimacy, Volume 1 last yeah. year. I'm waiting for Volume 2, Jeremy. Come on. It was yeah, so good. Yeah. <laughs> he, he deserves some more recognition, I think. Uh, I think he'll get it. He's, I think he's still pretty young and he's putting out a lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And he, so, he's, he's a um, good player. He shows me here that uh, he has a lot of different facets and he can turn mm -hmm. them on and off and... Uh, He's not a one pattern type of player. He has different influences and then he can adapt to the mood 
and uh, hold back but also let loose depending on the tune and what the expression is appropriate for uh, that situation so uh, yeah I think he's a a trumpet player with uh, not only great uh, technique but uh, a, a variety a palette of expression uh, that's kind of interesting and so he always uh, surprises me with you know what he pulls out in a particular situation yeah recommended all right and how about that the our palindromic episode is just yet another Wonder yeah, of music. Just fantastic. Yes. It was a happy week listening to all this. It's a happy week. And, yeah. and so, another happy week's coming up. I'm sure that the next two weeks are going to be very fruitful since... Yeah. We're They're certainly going to be full of music since you and I are both at home because we're now working from home because of the, this emergency we're has been be declared. We're working from home here and in Japan. we can't yeah. go out to drink or eat. And so what else is there to do? But stay well, we can home. go out to eat, but not to drink. That's well, the thing. Mm. Why? <laughs> They're kind of the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think uh, staying at home to drink and listen to music will be the best course of action, the yeah. safest treatment, and the greatest benefit to our listeners. Of course. Oh, we got some good stuff coming up for you next for the next two weeks. I know that from the classical end, anyway. That's right. Ru Russ will be choosing the jazz. I, I've got all classical coming for the next two weeks. I've so, got. Well, we'll I do. I do have a yeah. a classical piece that moved me. Uh, oh well, let's hear it in the bin, so we could get that out. Uh, yeah, that'd be good. Let's let's move everybody. Everybody needs to be let's moved. Move everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, They're all bitter. I we got to get them out of that. That's right. I, yeah. yeah. So nothing but positive vibes. Coming positive up. vibes from the Adult Music Podcast. If you're an That's adult, right. you should be feeling positive. That's right. So leave 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 the sullenness to the youth. To the youth. <laughs> be happy like yeah. us old guys here. Yeah, be happy like us old guys. We're like the old guys in Cocoon. So if you made it this far in the <laughs> podcast and you've enjoyed, uh, once again, we uh, ask you to please subscribe or follow us mm. on whatever platform you listen to. If you take a moment to write us a review or give us a rating that will also help us because there are more than a million podcasts now. They've mm -hmm. actually doubled under this COVID situation. So it's hard to get noticed, but we'd like to grow our audience even more. Uh, we've done better than we expected to begin with, but uh, it's hard to stay in the browsing categories on these platforms between episodes because there's so many new things pushing in. So mm. uh, if you just take a moment to uh, click on those likes or subscribes, uh, it will help us get noticed. And uh, also you'll be guaranteed to get the next episode when it's released. And again, if you'd like to contact us directly with any questions or comments, it's the adult music podcast, all one word at yeah. gmail.com. And this has been episode 11. And we will be back with episode 12 next week. Without fail, we will be there for you. Absolutely. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So until then, sit tight. Don't let the COVID bugs bite. Yeah. And stay at home with adult beverages and adult music. And we'll have some new recommendations for you. Uh, again, please check us out on Deezer. The whole list of music is available at one click under Adult Music Podcast Playlist. Uh, this one's number 11. Or find the links for each album in the podcast description for Spotify and Apple Music. So until next week... We bid you a good night and a good week, and we'll see you again next time.